Welcome to Theology for the Broken Church with the Broken Vessels podcast. Jeremiah 18.4 states, And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to do. This is the Broken Vessels Podcast. I'm your host, Joshua Simpkins. This is a podcast where we have discussions on theological themes for the broken to bring encouragement and hope in Christ. And I would like to welcome you back to another edition of the Broken Vessels podcast, and this being our special Theology for the Broken Church Christmas edition. As Brad and I did last month, we did a special episode on Thanksgiving. I hope that was a blessing to you. But we wanted to do something special for the Christmas season as well. And we wanted to talk about brokenness, Christmas, and the Incarnation. Brad, it's great to have you back on for another edition of Theology for the Broken Church. Welcome back and Merry Christmas. Hey, Merry Christmas, Josh. It's great to be back doing this once again with you. Amen. Amen. And Brad and I kind of tried to put our heads together and we wanted to really focus on the incarnation and how that brings healing to our brokenness. And we tried thinking of somebody really good to have on. And by God's grace, he gave us a gift this Christmas, and we get to have Bob Hiller on our program today, who many of you know Bob is a co-host with Michael Horton on the White Horse Sin. Bob is the senior pastor of Community Lutheran Church in Escondido, California. He is a baptized husband, father, and pastor, and he is also a content editor for the craft of preaching and a preacher on You Are Forgiven Radio, and he is also a 1517 contributor, which you guys know how much we love our 1517 guys here at the Broken Vessels Podcast. So, Amen. Bob, it is so wonderful to have you here on the Broken Vessels Podcast. Welcome. Thanks for having me on, guys, and love what you guys are doing. Thank you very much. All right. Well, praise the Lord. Well, we want to start off the conversation. We want to talk about Christmas and what it's become in our modern era, in the day that we live in. Because we look around us and there's a lot of things that we could point out, good things about Christmas that we love, and not necessarily in and of themselves moral things, but just good things that we love about Christmas. But there's other things that we see that maybe seem good, but they may not be that good. And then there's things that we see that aren't good. And those are all kind of the things that we want to talk about. But eventually we want to get to really talking about what Christmas is all about. And we kind of already spoiled that in the title, but the incarnation, Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. And we're going to get to that. But as we start off this conversation, I'm going to go ahead and start off with you, Brad. You had a lot to say about this as we were preparing for this episode on kind of the ideas that you have of like how we've gotten to where we're at as far as Christmas is concerned. So if you'd like to go ahead. Yeah. When we look at where we've come as a culture, when it comes to Christmas, the current situation with Christmas can really be traced back to higher criticism in Germany, people like Steiermacher, Ritual, Adolf Van Harnack. But just this idea that, as Michael Horton has coined, Christless Christianity, that Christ is not God, but a virtuous and wise teacher, that Christianity is not rooted in faith in Christ, but in our moral capacity and will and strength. Well, when you do that, you lose the actual joy of Christmas. And we'll get to that later. But what we're kind of seeing in our current moment is just that, a Christless Christmas that is all about our altruism and good behavior, our moralism. And as Francis Pieper said in his lectures in 1902, he was giving them to seminary students kind of in response to Harnack. And there's a book that's been translated into English, What is Christianity? It's been put out by 1517. He makes the point that when we lose the supernatural nature of Christianity, when we take the truth of the virgin birth, the miracles and all this out of it, and Jesus is just a good moral teacher, we're left with just moralism. And he says, the flesh expresses itself in relation to religion in a twofold manner. On the one hand, it says that there is no God, nor heaven or hell. All religion is folly. Let us eat, drink, and be merry. This is the materialistic flesh. 
On the other hand, there is the flesh that says there is a God, and in order to come to him, one must avoid sin and do the good. This is the religious flesh, but nevertheless, it is flesh. So we see materialism or moralism are the only two options left when we get rid of the truth about Jesus at Christmas. And this is what we've seen in our culture for the last 150, 200 years, these competing narratives of moralism and materialism. And yeah, sure, moralism is typically elevated as the better way. You see this in things like a Christmas carol, for example, right? Scrooge is supposed to repent of his materialism and embrace his moralism. But nevertheless, we have materialistic flesh or moralistic flesh flesh. And as Peter goes on to say, the flesh is not just lust and sensual appetites. It's the very righteousness, wisdom, and judgment of reason that wants to be justified through the law. So we have to understand, again, moralism versus materialism and true Christianity is about being justified by faith. And what we're celebrating at Christmas is the gospel. And that's what we want to recover. So Brad, you're talking about how the way that we look at Christmas now, it's very moralistic. There's a lot of things that have fed into it. And we're going to get into that a little bit more. But when I think about that, I think kind of like, you know, Santa Claus, you know, he's making a list, checking it twice, you know, (laughs) see who's naughty and nice. And we teach this to our kids and this idea of behaviorism and things like that. I think that's part of it. I, I also think another thing is the warm and fuzzy feelings that we kind of imbibe in during the holiday season that we feel like that's what it's about. It's about all the warm and fuzzies. It's all about the sentimentality of togetherness and of times gone by and things like that. And I mean, even I myself, I mean, I love Christmas, man. I mean, you should see our house. <laughs> it's, it is decorated to the hilt right now. We love Christmas here. And it does. It makes me feel good, man. When I'm sitting in my living room and all the Christmas lights are on and twinkling and everything, I'm just like, man, I love this. But that is not what is at the core of what Christmas is about, you know? And there is a sense in which, in the modern era in which we live, we've lost something about what Christmas is. It seems like the incarnation, Jesus Christ coming in the flesh, has become this afterthought. And I guess that's my question to both you and Bob. Why are we where we are, I guess, is my question. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up pietism and liberalism. I was thinking about this when I was preparing for the show. Where do we see pietism, liberalism, where do we see them kind of creeping in to the Christmas conversation? And definitely Santa Claus, right? Santa Claus, old Saint Nick with the whole naughty or nice, and you get a lump of coal or you get yeah. uh, something positive like a Nintendo. Those are the options, by the way. <laughs> you get a Nintendo uh, Switch or a lump of coal. Right. <laughs> A strange trade off, or now we have Elf on a Shelf, which is, I think, oh, yeah, I don't know if you guys have Elf on the Shelf, and we I, do. I'm, I'm <laughs> with you, I'm the big Christmas guy, but that one's pushing me a little too far. But think about this so, where do you find hope at Christmas? I'll tell you where you find hope at Christmas Nordstrom, <laughs> where it says hope, <laughs> like it's the only place talking about it is the store and the church. But we have two different stories here, and mm. one of the things. I think we see is the language this time of year of peace on earth and goodwill to all. Now, this is biblical language, and yeah. here is always the poison of liberalism. Mm-hmm. Liberalism wants peace on earth and goodwill to all, and they'll use a Bible verse to get there. And we all want this, by the way. Liberals are not bad for wanting peace on earth and goodwill to all. But that verse, as important as that is, and as much as we all strive for that and work towards that, especially at Christmas time. Really, that's a song sung by the angels. Mm -hmm. Uh, Peace on earth, goodwill upon those whom his favor rests. Yeah. And it's actually a proclamation of the gospel, not that we would all kind of strive for some sort of unified feeling of peace, but rather the baby that is born, God in that manger has come to reconcile you to God so that there is actual peace between heaven and earth now because the heavenly being himself, God, has entered into the earth and put himself into the flesh of the earth, frankly, into the flesh of a baby. So what we see here is some incredible gospel language being ripped away from Christ and put into some sort of moralistic category that suddenly becomes... Christmas becomes more depressing and almost more suffocating because it almost is like we're pretending. We're pretending for this. Yeah, it really does become like a hollow moralism. Like I said in our Thanksgiving episode, you're just supposed to be thankful because it's good for you, but it loses the ground of Thanksgiving, which is the gospel. Bishop Justin Holcomb says about it being cruel 
And they just think that's such a clarifying insight that it's actually cruel to the broken to just heap these burdens on them. And so I love how that song that the angels sang that you referenced, Bob, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill towards men. That's in response to the announcement of the gospel. He says, I bring you good news that causes great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. And then a great company appears and starts singing in response to the announcement of the gospel. Machen's got a great quote. He says, Christ died. That is history. Christ died for our sins. That is doctrine. Without these two elements joined in absolute dissoluble union, there is no Christianity. So you can't separate history from doctrine. And what we have here is the history of God being born in a manger. That's facts. And then the doctrine of it is it's for us and for our salvation. And so our joyful response, our happiness, our great joy is in response to these facts. What has God done to save us? Luther makes the comment to this effect, we don't celebrate here mere history, though of course Luther's not denying the history of it, but we don't celebrate here mere history, but we celebrate a gift. We celebrate a promise. And this is exactly what's going on, that the baby born is born for you. This is why it's good news. God coming down? That's not immediately good news. We are currently reading through some of the prophets. I don't know if you guys follow the lectionary, but currently we are hearing from fun Christmas guys singing carols like Amos and Zephaniah saying, woe to you who want the day of the Lord. And, yeah. Uh, God's going to open up his house and it's going to be judgment on everyone. Mm-hmm. This appearance of God does not necessarily mean it's all going to be joy and happiness. This could be a terrifying thing for sinners, but the way in which he comes and the way in which he gives himself to us alleviates our fears. And Jesus shows up to say, I've come to do something about your sin that you would not believe. And you're going to find it in the most shocking of places. You're not going to know God or anything properly until you see him in the manger, on the cross, in the arms of Mary. This is where Christ comes for us. So this is God coming as a gift, not as a threat. Luther has this great line where he says, no one's really wanting to go and see a baby in a manger. No one wants to go. They're like, they're all busy. They're all walking around. But the angels aren't ashamed of it. The angels love it. So you got thousands upon thousands of angels showing up and singing the praises of the Lord Jesus there in the manger in the arms of his mother. It's pretty powerful. Amen. Amen. So we kind of understand a little bit, you know, pietism has done a lot to hurt the church and this performance-based moralism. And just like me and Brad have talked about, you either have a right-wing moralism or a left-wing moralism. It doesn't matter which side of the spectrum you're on. It's still all moralism. So that's what Christmas has become. But I guess what we want to talk about next is what did it look like historically? for the church. I mean, we started celebrating Christmas for a reason. I know there's those people out there that say, well, it's a pagan holiday, and that's the reason we celebrate it. The Catholic Church started it, and it's because it's pagan and, and this and that. But, I mean, there is a reason why we want to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, and we want to celebrate the Incarnation. And I do believe, historically, the church had a right understanding of this, and God's people had a right understanding of that. But what did it look like to the church fathers and to those in the Reformation when they talked about the incarnation and the season of Christmas. If I could just really quickly speak to that, two quick thoughts. One, maybe we should also not too quickly move past, we're we're pointing the finger a lot at the culture right now, the way the church introduces some of this pietism. Yeah. Yeah. Like little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. I always feel like that's some like passive aggressive mother who wrote that line to (laughs) make her kids stop them from crying because Jesus doesn't cry, neither should you. Silent night, probably not. Jesus born this way. I mean, like we've really sanitized Mm. the whole thing. And then we moralized it with like the little drummer boy who this little Pelagian drum kit shows up and he (laughs) wants to uh, play a song to make Jesus love him. Like, come on. That is a really good point. I'm really glad you brought that up. I love that line where I was in one of your recent episodes on the White Horse and somebody said pietism decayed into liberalism. Yeah. Yeah. And it was so like insightful and helpful. Like Horton did a great job of pointing out how the Anabaptists had some of these same ideas that later sort of emerged in the 19th century. You know, in a sense, there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, there were heretics and detractors in the ancient church. There was all kinds of things swirling around the Reformation. It's just, sadly, some of these bad ideas sort of gained prominence in our institutions of Western culture 
yeah. over the last century and a half. And so we're kind of dealing with the fallout of that, where the true faith is sort of marginalized and pushed away from the center of the social dialogue now. But yeah, the church is so much responsible for where we are. Judgment begins in the house of God. I mean, we look back at the ways the church has failed. The culture's downstream of the church. Yep. So yep. the failure to teach the faith is in large part why we are where we are. Yeah, my brother is a very smart guy, got his master's in theology from Yale Divinity School. And one of the things I remember about going to the graduation there was the Divinity School was at the top, right? And all the other schools are downhill because it used to be that that was the queen of the sciences. It was called theology. But it seems as though everyone's kind of climbed up into the theology schools and began to saturate it with other sort of ways of thinking. And you've referenced Peeper, and he just nails this kind of stuff. Walther, who was CFW Walther, Peeper's teacher, does the same. And then, of course, Machen is just the champion of calling this sort of stuff out. But what you find is that when that pietism creeps in, it always kind of starts in the academy and saturates everything else, and you start to influence the pastors in this stuff, and it gets into the churches. So we had a big old blow-up about this whole thing in the 70s, and then Missouri Synod. And we don't need to get too much into this, but the president of our synod, a guy by the name of J.E.O. Preuss, said the thing that saved our church body was the laity. It was people, and I think this is so important for the laity to hear, was people who knew their Bibles and knew their catechisms. So when their pastors came in and started preaching stuff that was out of line, they could say, hold on, that is not what my Bible says. That is not what our catechisms teach. This is not who we are. And they could stand up for the word of God, even against, you know, the great educated clergy or whatever. Right. God bless our pastors. I'm a pastor. I love what I do. Don't take this the wrong way. But it's the word of God that matters. Amen. And so this is what now needs to dominate the way we do to Christmas, especially at Christmas, because it is the most influential of our holidays. Mm -hmm. This is the time to champion faithful preaching and teaching of the Word of God. And what you find out is that it's actually just better. It's a lot more fun. It's just, it's more beautiful. The other thing I think that's worth pointing out is in the history of the church, you will get this conversation about how, oh, the church just came and they took over pagan holidays, as you were saying. Yeah. they're, They're doing this pagan stuff. Great. Why not? Let's take it and make it better by putting Christ into it. I mean, this is not something necessarily to decry. Now, if we're saying something like this, we stole the virgin birth story from some bizarre Egyptian god. All right. That's a weak sauce argument that's easily dismissed. But to say that, hey, the cultures were celebrating and we realize that there's something even better worth celebrating. That is the birth of our Savior. Mm -hmm. Let's just take over the celebration and make it about Christ. And that's actually a pretty wonderful thing. Yeah. Yeah. So like what did Luther and some of the other reformers like what did they have to say about Christmas? I mean, I know like in Germany, Christmas is a big deal, you know, so obviously it had to have been even in his time. And I'm sure that even Luther himself, especially because of the fact that people are pulling away from the Catholic Church, you know, and the Catholic Church were kind of the ones that were really pushing, you know, the celebration of Christmas and all of that. Was there a lot of dissension because of the holiday? And what did Luther have to say about things like that? Well, Luther is not an iconoclast. So what what you'll see with like a lot of the Anabaptist movement is there'll be a a, the radical reformation, let's call it. Their movement is to be anti-Rome. Right. Right. Luther is not anti-Rome. And I think you guys could do better on this than I can. But I think Calvin, to a certain extent, is the same way. He's not anti-Rome. He's anti-false teaching from the pulpit. Amen. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's a view to reform the church not to revolt against the church. Right. So with things like the holidays, especially with the holidays, Luther says, look, here's what we have. We have a whole year lined up for us that we can listen and be taught the whole counsel of God. So we're going to keep the holidays. We're going to keep art and woodcuts and paintings and things like this because it helps the laity learn what's going on here. So especially with Christmas, Luther just, I mean, he's just wonderful. If you can get your hands on it. Roland Baton has an edition called Martin Luther's Christmas Book, where he takes a bunch of snippets of Luther's stuff and he puts it together in this beautiful, beautiful writing. And Baton says, when you come to the Reformation, Christmas celebrations were very ethereal and glorious, and Luther made them very earthy. 
Hmm. Um, So he'll talk a lot about the vocation of the shepherd, and he'll talk about how Mary, when the angel appeared to her, what was Mary doing? She may have been praying, but also pretty likely she's doing chores, just like the ladies in the Old Testament when someone divine would appear or an angel would appear, probably like mopping the floor or something along these lines. And then once she encountered Jesus, what did she do? Or once she encountered the angel, I should say, what did she do? Probably went back to her chores, right? Like it's very earthy. I mean, we can get into a little bit more of that, but what Luther does here, besides inventing the Christmas tree, I think we all know he didn't do that. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Luther's credited with bringing lights into the tree or something like this. I don't remember the whole story, but we at least have this earthiness and this, this is where I think it becomes very helpful for talking to people who are broken at Christmas time. Yeah. When we hear the way the scriptures actually convey the incarnation and the way Luther actually preaches the coming of Christ. Jesus comes for broken, earthy, ruined people. Mm. And this is exactly where we find him. Well, and I love that because it kind of speaks like the hiddenness of God, God being small, God under his opposite. That's such good news for those of us who are really broken because we are not able to sort of ascend up to God to where he is. We're alienated, but God has brought himself to us in our destitution. In fact, all the way back in the ancient church, Athanasius, what we call on the incarnation, he speaks to this, how because of our bondage to our idolatry and the darkness of our understanding and our eyes that were meant to look to heaven, look to God, had sort of looked to earthly things and our minds were set on earthly things. And so he says, man was seeking God in creation, right? This is Paul in Romans 1. We stop worshiping the creator God of heaven and earth and we're worshiping creation. So then Aaron says, so God became flesh. He took on a body so that he would be below us so that we would, in our looking downward Mm. into creation, we would see God. We would get him. So God condescended to us in our brokenness, in our downward bent and gave himself to us where we could find him. And of course, by extension, then it's like ordinary things like bread and wine. We take hold of the promise. So It's just really beautiful. The true Christmas story is so much better than Hallmark or Charles Dickens. Amen to that. Amen to that. I don't know. I mean, all right. (laughs) We're talking theology of the cross. I have to suffer through some of those Hallmark movies every Christmas, you know? And that's some some brutal stuff right there, man. Uh, (laughs) Amen to that, too. Anyway... (laughs) I do have to say, though, I do like Christmas movies, certain ones, but yeah, I can't do the Hallmark stuff. That's a nightmare. Anyway, (laughs) um, so we see kind of how in Reformation times and as the church and Luther in particular, they looked at the incarnation and Christmas and the way that they taught it from the pulpit and things like that. And then down through time, and we see like you talk about the Anabaptists, and obviously we all know they had a very huge influence on 18th, 19th century, all the way up. I mean, 19th century on up specifically, you know, and then the pietism that came into, which, I mean, I, Dad Rod did make the point. It was the Lutherans that brought us pietism, and he apologized, So we and we accepted his apology. <laughs> Thank you, because that is, that is all on us. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing is, is that that pietism, it went right hand in hand with a lot of the junk that Anabaptists were pushing too. It was just, again, it's bad theology. You know, it's bad theology and we all have a legal bent in our heart. So it's just natural for us to be like, hey, yeah, I can do it. I can make it happen. Somehow I can make it. And that's the great thing about the incarnation that God sent a little baby, became a little baby for us. How awesome is that? The incarnation, the fact that God himself came in the flesh (laughs) and he had to do it because we can't do it because we're broken. And that's really what I want to talk about now is the loss of this historical and biblical understanding of the incarnation. It's brought a lot of brokenness to the church and to us as individual Christians. I want to get down to just like even specifics on the kind of things that we see during the Christmas season, but not only that, but just in our lives that right down at the core of trying to live the Christian life and we're all messed up and we're broken and we need to have a view of what God did during Christmas, (laughs) you know? But the thing is, is how has it been that all of this bad teaching has brought us brokenness? So I just kind of want you guys to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I was raised in an Anabaptist tradition. And one of the kind of cliche Christmas sayings was wise men still seek him. (laughs) It's so Pelagian. 
and it just flies in the face of Romans three, none seeks after God. Right. <laughs> There's no one good. But yet, like, even when I became a Christian, there was a lot of people who were like speaking to me as if like it was my sort of intelligence or like wisdom that was good job. You've made the better choice. You know, you're making this wise decision to follow Christ. And like I said at the beginning, it hollows out the substance and the joy. And it's so moralistic. Christ and his works are no longer the emphasis. Jesus didn't do the spectacular thing for me. God did his part. As one preacher said, you know, he put the down payment on a home in heaven. The rest is up to you. How bad do you want it? So now it's all about what we do. And so the the emphasis is on the wrong syllable, as they say. (laughs) Um, And so it's like, hey, you're so wise. You're seeking the Lord. And Christmas just took on, again, this whole kind of moralistic legalism. And so there was, as Bob mentioned, that sort of sanitizing of the narrative. You don't think of Mary as like a teenage girl giving birth and how like earthy that is. And scandalous. And and scandalous and being in like a a barn. (laughs) It was unclean. I'm a father of five, so I've been present at several births. And like, I can't imagine going through that in a stable. So yeah, just from my own experience growing up, the wonder of Christmas was really lost. And the Jesus religion that I had was so steeped in pietism and the Anabaptist tradition that something as cliche as wise men still seek him and all of its Pelagian implications, like that was the theology that I grew up with. Yeah, I can remember, you know, I grew up in, you know, independent fundamental Baptist circles myself growing up. And I just think about every year, I loved Christmas every year. I loved doing our Christmas program, our Sunday school Christmas program every year. I always got to be in there. I was either like a shepherd or, you know, an angel or something like that. But always the emphasis whenever it came from the pulpit, literally what my church was teaching us as little kids about Christmas is all about this. Are you going to bow at the manger like the shepherds and surrender? Or your life to the baby Jesus, you know, kind of thing. Like, like it was all about me. It wasn't about God in the flesh is there in the manger and that he came for me. It was all about what am I going to do? Yeah. And like that whole, like, you know, there was no room for him in the end. Like what about the end of your heart? Oh, that song. Have you heard that song, that one Christmas carol that's talking about like the room in the end and like, it's all about, is there room in your heart for Jesus or whatever? Yeah. So instead oh, of like goodness. focusing on the fact that God became flesh for us and for our salvation, it's okay. Are you going to like make room for Jesus? And it's like, well, no, we haven't made room for Jesus, but that's precisely why he came. All right. So it's probably worth, at this point, actually looking at the text, right? Amen. So let's talk about the wise men who seek him. They're first off, they're not wise. Matthew, like, falls all over himself to show us what knuckleheads these guys are. <laughs> yep. uh, they're magicians who gaze at stars. Somehow, the Lord works through these stars. I think we have some indication that they may have had some Hebrew text there. So bring them. And where do they go? Right to the Lord? No, they go to the dude who wants to murder the Lord. Yeah, right? They go to yeah. Herod. They have to have divine intervention at every single turn before they finally arrive at the right place. The message here is that Jesus is coming for exactly who you don't think he's coming for, and he's not going to let their foolishness stop him. I mean, that's mm-hmm. the story of the Magi. It's not the wise men still seek him. No. These guys... We're going to see him in heaven. They're going to be like, we have no idea how we got there. It was crazy. He <laughs> <laughs> woke up in dreams. Like, this is just, yeah. this is something. It even speaks to how he is going to be the one in whom the Gentiles hope. Yep. Yeah. Well, it's these kings of Persia, the Gentiles, they're coming to find the king of the Jews. We've seen his star in heaven. Like It's testifying to the fact that Christ is the Messiah. This Jesus yep. of Nazareth is the Christ promised in the Old Testament. Yep. God's made good. His promises. So it's all meant to be a confirmation of the gospel. Believe yep. on this one because he is the one who is promised. He's the one we've been waiting for. Not yep. emulate them wise men because they're so cool. Sure. I mean, should we follow the word? Absolutely. But you know what? Here's the good thing is he gave you the word. Amen. But he's got the scriptures here for you. Trust this. Same thing with the whole birth narrative where You know, Mary's running through the city, pregnant, and Joseph is banging on all the doors, and no one's letting this poor pregnant woman in because they're all so mean. (laughs) Like, probably, when it says there's no room in the inn, it's going to ruin everyone's nativity scene, and that's okay. The inn, you translate that word, it's the same word that is used for the upper room in the Lord's Supper account. 
Yeah. And so in other words, Joseph and Mary have probably been in Bethlehem for a while on account of the census. They're staying with the family. The family says, hey, birth is messy. Go downstairs with the animals. And so they send them downstairs. So where do we find Jesus initially? Rejected by his own family. For you who, this Christmas, speaking of people who are broken, you have a painful family experience coming up. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're missing your family. You're not welcome with your family. Your family has rejected you. You find yourself with the Lord Jesus, and the Lord Jesus finds himself with you because that's how, that's how he was born, downstairs with the animals because the family didn't want him around. I mean, this is, this is a whole different narrative that the scriptures actually give us that actually is far more hopeful to see that this is the way God chooses to show up, rejected, despised, right off the bat, and he's mm. going to go that way until he's on the cross, and it's at that point. He's going to begin to gather us all to himself. I mean, the Lord is just so gracious and kind in the way he comes to us. Man, that is good. Brothers and sisters in Christ, just think about that. I mean, this is really what I wanted to get to at this point in the conversation. Because I think about myself. I mean, you all know, I've shared on this program, I have four adult children I don't have a relationship with. I send them Merry Christmas messages every Christmas, and I never really hear anything back. I love my kids, but it is just what it is. So I can very much relate to what Bob just said. Those feelings of rejection that we sometimes face from our own family. But I can be joyful. and I can rest in Jesus. I share in the fellowship of his sufferings. Yep. Yep. He Amen. was rejected from the time he was in the cradle all the way to the grave. Amen. And, and he's still rejected even though he rose again from the dead yep. by people. But man, that is a good word. So, Amen. you know, I know this is a hard time of year for a lot of you that are listening to this program. It is so hard. You may have lost somebody just because they died. They may have just passed away. This might be the first holiday you're having to spend without your mother or your father or your brother or sister or even your child. You know what? That is hard. And it's okay for that to be hard. You know, Brad, we talked about during our Thanksgiving episode, how people try to take thankfulness and turn it into a work and almost weaponize it. The church does not only do that with Thanksgiving. They do that with joyfulness. Mm-hmm. Well, you just need to be joyful in all the suffering that you're going through. Well, yeah, th- does the Bible talk about joy and suffering? Of course it does. But they turn it into this work where, like, if you're not joyful going through this thing that you're going through right now, and Brad, you know I've shared this, and you, my listeners, know I've shared this, where I've actually had a biblical counselor tell me that. When I was in a deep depression and he was like, well, you don't seem like you have much joy in the Lord. Maybe you better check to see if you really know the Lord at all or not. And they turn joy into a work. I'm telling you what, brothers and sisters, if you're not joyful during the holiday season, it's okay. (laughs) I just want to tell you that it's okay. But you can rest in the objective truth of Christ. So I did want to just say that because, Bob, man, that was a good word that you just shared. So we can obviously see there's so much brokenness. I mean, we could talk for hours and hours and hours about all the brokenness that we see that comes as a result of all the bad teaching, just the church in general. And I agree with you, Bob, especially spiritual leaders. They like to blame the culture. It's it's not the culture. The church is the one that sets the stage and sets the standard. But what I want to do is I want to talk about how are we going to reclaim a proper biblical and historical perspective on Christmas. And this has to start, like you said, in the pulpit. Pastors need to get right on this because they're the ones teaching the people. So how are we going to do that? What are we going to do as a church to be able to help people to be able to enjoy Christmas because of what it's really about? And I'll turn this over to you, Bob. Well, I'll tell you the first place I think we start is Advent I have seen this lately, and I worry that it's a trend, but I do think there's something positive here, that there's a recovery of Advent in the broader evangelical church. Mm. In a liturgical church, we've always had Advent, but Advent is not pre-Christmas. Advent is a time for rending your garments and repenting. It's like Lent before Christmas. You know, if you ever see the candles, you got the Advent wreath, and you got Mm -hmm. three pink candles and one purple candle. Yeah. That purple candle is actually, wait, no, I'm sorry. Three purple purple candles. candles. Yeah, I'm the, I, I, I <laughs> bought the liturgy once. Uh, <laughs> the one pink candle is called. Now this is a lot of fun here. Great biblical constellation. It's called the Gaudate candle. That means joy. It's a rejoicing candle, and it's the time in the Advent year where you're supposed to break a fast. Up to that point, 
you're fasting, and then you're reminded he's coming soon. There is joy on the way, but there's still time for fasting. I've heard a number of churches do a practice called Blue Christmas, riffing on Elvis, I guess, but they're going to do a service during Advent, just allowing people to mourn, Hmm. adjusting hymns of lamentation. This is good. This is what we see taking place in the Psalms. This is what we see the people crying out. When you see Herod slaughtering the babies, when you see the pain and the angst that the Jewish people are going through when Christ arrives, when we see the angst and the pain going on in the world around us, and we just don't feel like pretending anymore, Church is hopefully with the recovery of Advent getting us back to this point where we can say this is the place to be honest and sorrowful and cry out to God in frustration and lamentation, but also knowing hope is on the way. Amen. I love that Advent hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Yeah. And yeah. just the tenor of that song, like there's something almost eerie and mournful about it. And like, I just remember being a kid and like this time of year is hard for me. There's pain from various experiences in my upbringing and it's really dark. You know, there's not a lot of sunlight and these kinds of things. So I just remember like as a young person desiring the joy of the season, but feeling a lot of brokenness. Yeah. And I just, I didn't understand the gospel yet, but I remember hearing that hymn and just like it resonated with me in my sense of alienation and brokenness. It's just like, this makes sense. We should be lamenting right now. Dan Van Voorhis, who's a wonderful contributor for us over at 1517, he does the Christian History Almanac. If you want great Christmas stuff, go to him. This is sort of his wheelhouse. But one of the stories he tells that I didn't know is when you hear the song, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, you know there's that line in Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, hang a shining star on the highest bough. Uh, Mm -hmm. That is not the line. Do you know this story? It's great. No. (laughs) That line was put in there by Frank Sinatra because they were going to put out an album, and Sinatra said the actual line is, we'll have to muddle through somehow, Yeah. which is exactly how the majority of us are feeling this time of year. Right, right. (laughs) And Sinatra's like, you know, that's not very chipper. Let's change it. And so he changes the line to some nonsense about a star on a bow. No, man. Even the culture is trying to rip away your ability to mourn and weep and muddle through this time of year. This is the time of year to be melancholy. Now, I live in San Diego County. We're never melancholy. It's 72 degrees every day. (laughs) But this is the time of year where the majority of the world, it's darker. And that hits us physically, emotionally. Yeah. It's difficult. As you were saying, Josh, this is a time of year where the death of someone you love is very pronounced. The separation is very pronounced. It's hard to muddle through. That means it's the time of year where God says, all right, lay it on me. What are your frustrations? I've given you prayers to pray. They're called Psalms and there's laments in there. Cry out to me. How long, O Lord? O come, O come, Emmanuel is not how long until we get to open presents. It's how much more muddling do we have left, God? You promised something good. We're almost at the end of it. We're almost Mm -hmm. crushed. But God will not back off his promises. And so we cling to him. We trust him even in our lament. We're holding on to him saying, prove yourself right. We trust you. Now show us. Amen. Yeah, and it's interesting too because sometimes people want to kind of separate the incarnation from the cross. And there's a tendency towards that because of the liberalism that we were talking about. It's okay to talk about Jesus as a person, as like a good moral person, as a teacher. But the cross is too explicitly gospel. And it's sort of gruesome and ancient, cruel punishment, bloody. Like, how do you make the cross pretty? It's, you know... We like babies. We like the idea of a fresh start, a new beginning. And so there's this tendency to sort of separate out the incarnation from the cross. And that's a huge mistake, especially for those of us who are broken, suffering, mournful at Christmas. He was born to die. And what's so fascinating is sometimes people will say that Athanasius has this heavier accent on the incarnation and not on the atonement. That's not true. You just have to read what he said. <laughs> oh, you think yeah. like we should actually read him instead of just accuse him. That's pretty good. I like yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. But Paul writes this line to Timothy, and it's basically a summary of what Athanasius does in his book. Paul says this in Scripture, This grace was given us in Christ before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. We are celebrating that God has appeared and brought life and light to us, destroyed death, brought life and light through the gospel. 
And so Athanasius is all about God took on flesh. He appeared to bear the penalty to die on the cross. He has this great line. I'll just read it. He says, if after the night, the sun appears and every earthly place is enlightened by it, there is no doubt at all that the sun spreading its light out everywhere is also the one chasing away the dark and illuminating everything. So also with death being despised and trampled down since the saving manifestation of the Savior in the body and on the conclusion of the cross, it is clear that he is the Savior being revealed in the body, destroying death and daily displaying the trophies of his grace in his disciples. He's doing that. He appeared to take away sin. He appeared to destroy death. He appeared to bring light and life and immortality to us. This is why he came. He was born to die. And so I love those images where you see like the manger and the cross. Maybe it's the shadow of a cross or the cross is in the background. This is why he took on flesh. We were under the curse and he had to become a curse and he had to do it in our flesh. We needed a human to represent us. So everything about the gospel, right? It's a whole package. It's the person and work of Christ. You don't separate the incarnation from the cross. The conclusion of it is the cross. The victory of the resurrection, his ascension into glory, all of it is what we need. It's who he is for us. And that's why in the creed it says, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was conceived of the spirit, born of the virgin, and was made man. It's for us. It's for our salvation. So there's no separation there. He appeared to abolish death and bring immortality and light through the gospel. Luther, in one of his Christmas Day sermons, if I could read kind of a a longer quote here, he says this. Now, if we human beings properly consider this fact, and if we wholeheartedly believe this, that Christ put on our flesh, then such inexpressible grace and blessing from our dear Lord should give us very great joy and should drive us to thank him with our whole hearts and move us to gladly obey his will and to live godly lives. When we were still under the papacy, they used to tell this story. Once upon a time, the devil attended mass in a church where it was customary in either the Lord's Prayer or the Creed to sing at homo factus est, that God became a man. That is, God's son has become a human being. While they were singing this, the people just remained standing and did not kneel down. The devil was so incensed that he slammed his fist into one man's mouth saying, you boorish bum, aren't you ashamed to just stand there? like a post and refuse to kneel for joy? If God had become our brother as he did become your brother, our joy would be so great that we wouldn't know what to do with ourselves. That's so good. I mean, think about this. God in Christ, he's become your Lord, your Savior. He's become your brother. Amen. And now one in your flesh stands before the Father, wounds exposed, saying, Father, have mercy on them because these wounds are on their account. This is for them. So you have the incarnation and you have the crucifixion. It's one package deal. You don't get one without the other. And whenever you try and think of Jesus that way, whenever you try and separate Christ from his cross, Jesus rebukes you. Uh, This is what he does to Peter when Peter tries to separate the Christ from the cross. You don't get this in the New Testament. You don't have the gospel without the substitutionary bloody atonement of Jesus. You just don't. What you have to understand is that that substitutionary bloody atonement is God for you. As Amen. Quite yeah, and that's kind of where I want to end this, is that is what Christmas is, Christ for you. And what is Christ for you? The gospel. It's yeah. good news. It was good news when the angels came and announced his coming, and it was good news when he went to the cross for us, and it's good news that he rose again from the dead and it's good news that he ascended on high and that he sits at the right hand of the father now and he intercedes and he advocates for us. And it's good news that he is coming again. (laughs) It's all good news. And it's all good news that he did it for us. I mean, that's the incarnation. It's the whole ball of wax folks. It's not just the baby in the manger. God in the flesh came to this earth to save you because he is that gracious and he is that merciful. That, that is good news. This Christmas season, brothers and sisters in Christ, think about that. And we just said, it's okay to lament <laughs> during this time of year. But, oh, even when in your lamentation, just like in the hymn, that, the Christmas carol that these brothers talked about, O come, O come, Emmanuel, the first verse, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. Israel was captive. Ransom captive Israel that mourns in lowly exile here until the Son of God appear. And then what do they say? Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to you, O Israel. And he came. 
Unfortunately, they rejected him, but he came. Amen. I mean, praise God. Wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. He came and he lived and he died on our behalf and rose again from the dead to give us peace. He came to give you peace even in the midst of the turmoil that you're in during this time of year. Look to Jesus. Look to your Savior. Look to Christ for you. Look to the incarnation on this Christmas season. Not to the Hallmark movies. Not to all those things. Bob, it has been wonderful having you on the Broken Vessels podcast with me and Brad today. Um, You've been such a blessing. How can uh, people find you? Uh, obviously, listening to the White Horse Inn with Michael Horton and checking you out on 1517, but what are other ways that they can reach out to you on social media uh, and whatnot? Yeah, you just find me on Facebook and, and the Twitter and uh, or the X, or uh, I don't know if I'm even allowed to be on there anymore. That's where <laughs> yeah. I am. And, uh, uh, that's, that's really where you'll find me. You can go to my church website, clcfamily.org, see our sermons and stuff there. But yeah. Yeah, well, thank, thank you for having me on. This yeah, been, thank you so much great. for being on here and, and for Merry sharing Christmas, with guys. our listeners. Merry Christmas yeah, to you as amen. well. And Brad, uh, thanks again, man. This has been great having this conversation. Thank you so much for all that you added to the conversation. And Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you as well, brother. Amen. Merry Christmas. And I can't wait to do this some more in the new year. Amen. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, thank you again for joining us for another episode of Theology for the Broken Church. We hope that you have a wonderful Christmas holiday. Just please look to Christ, rest in the incarnation, rest in what Christ did for you. We'll see you next week. (laughs) 